Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mashuru Masuta Ramutle. I would like to welcome you all to the first of the Research Policy Dialogue series under the theme Tax and Benefit Responses to the Coronavirus Pandemic here in South Africa. This dialogue is a part of a Southern African Towards Inclusive Economic Development, that's SA TIDE program. This is the first uh, in a series of six dialogues that we will bring you over the next few months. So SA TIDE is a collaborative research, policy making, and capacity building partnership with the national between the National Treasury, United Nations University, World Institute for Economic Development, that's uni wider, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning and Monitoring. Uh, planning, monitoring and evaluation, the Department of Trade Industry and Competition, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute and the European Union. The program also includes a number of local and international universities. So everyone, since its inception in 2017, the program's goal is improved economic research for informed evidence-based uh, policy to promote inclusive growth in South Africa and the region. It is a result of a unique collaboration between local and international officials and experts under six work streams, mainly enterprise development, public revenue, macro modeling, inequality, energy and uh, climate and regional growth. So today our main focus will be on the public revenue mobilization for inclusive development work stream, where we will seek to tackle issues surrounding South Africa's tax and benefit responses to the coronavirus pandemic. As we know, COVID-19 has devastated uh, and has had a devastating and lasting impact on livelihoods and incomes, not just in South Africa, uh, but uh, the world over. So governments needed to move fast and implement measures to mitigate this negative impact that the coronavirus or the COVID-19 has had on society. And this despite a sharp reduction in tax revenues, even measured against a decline in GDP. So today our guests will give an insight into the impacts of the pandemic and the tax benefit policies that were introduced in 2020 on poverty and inequality in the country on the basis of a recent large scale study. So to break down this large scale study, I'd like to uh, introduce or to call upon Yuka Pertula. He's a non-resident non researcher at UniWider and Professor of Public Economics at the University of Helsinki. So he'll kick off our program with a synthesis presentation of research findings produced under Workstream Public Revenue Mobilization for Inclusive Development. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Yuka. You can carry on with your presentation, please. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can um, now um, share my screen. Can you see my slides now? Okay, yes. so um, thank you once again. Uh, thank you colleagues for joining. Um, I'm pleased to be um, uh, uh, a participant to this policy dialogue or, or rather giving them the backdrop for it and um, give you a, a glimpse of uh, what we've been doing at the, uh, uh, in terms of research in the area of public revenue mobilization. So uh, the activities under this work stream uh, include, for example, uh, that we have um, uh, uh, people have been writing um, uh, approximately around 15 studies on tax matters. So there was an open call and, and, and most um, uh, research teams were selected on the basis of that call. But then we also asked uh, certain colleagues to contribute um, or asked them directly to contribute to the program. If I'm not mistaken, all of these studies actually have uh, South African researchers as co-authors, um, often with, together with international colleagues, uh, but some are, are solely authored by, by South Africa-based researchers. And what I really like is that the, uh, many of the papers also have authors uh, uh, from within the administration, um, especially the National Treasury and the South African Revenue Service SARS. 
Uh, so in addition to um, providing uh, uh, these research papers that try to speak to um, matters pertinent to the uh, development of the tax system in South Africa, uh, we'll also be engaged in um, infrastructure development or research infrastructure development and uh, training activities. And, and, and chief among the uh, uh, research infrastructure uh, activities has really been the, the maintenance and the development of the secure data lab, uh, uh, which is um, housed at the National Treasury. So that data lab offers really, I mean, I would say world-class uh, administrative data uh, that researchers can access at the, at the data lab. And uh, um, the, the data stem from um, the uh, uh, tax records of the, of the South Africa Revenue Service. Obviously, the data are anonymized and, 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 and people can ac ac access them securely. Uh, and these data have been used for, for tax research purposes, but also otherwise. Uh, and then we have also been engaged in the um, development of research tools, especially a tool called tax benefit microsimulation. And later on, we hear an example of a study uh, prepared by, by, by such a model. We also been engaged in um, communicating the research findings by providing uh, research briefs and, and by <clears throat> organizing events. So let me now give you just a couple of examples of the um, research findings that have been generated um, during the program. So it goes without saying that the South African government has um, uh, significant um, tax raising capacity, um, simply because the um, tax to GDP ratio is, is far above uh, that of in, in, in comparable countries. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be scope for improvement in terms of um, designing the, um, the tax system. Uh, so in the area of taxation of enterprises, uh, research under this work stream uh, suggests that the, not all of the depreciation allowances uh, uh, that are given would really be justified. And it also suggests that the uh, uh, the incentives provided by the um, uh, uh, corporate income tax systems system are not really geared towards um, achieving greater productivity growth in South Africa. Rather, they, uh, um, the, the, the biggest incentives are given the, in a sense in the areas of, 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 if you wish, old industries. And they are not necessarily uh, targeted at um, increasing uh, research and development activities in in the area of software, for example. Uh, thinking of tax enforcement, then, uh, uh, there's research uh, suggesting that the, uh, in the area of corporate income tax, there's also <clears throat> a large tax gap. And addressing that, that tax gap, and, and also more broadly, uh, in order to understand the uh, uh, the impacts of enforcement acti activities, we would actually also uh, need to carry out a little bit more research uh, on, on those activities. Uh, let me now turn uh, to the area of um, taxing individuals, that's for the personal income tax. And we tax economists often think of um, direct transfers, like social grants, as a part of, of that system. Uh, so taxing and giving um, grants to individuals, that system needs to be efficient, so not to distort too much incentives for work, for example. But it also needs to um, achieve um, an equitable distribution of income. And in seeing um, uh, taxes and benefits in, in reaching the uh, 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 equity goals, uh, research really uh, highlights that we would need to think of taxes and benefits as a system. So not every tax instrument needs to be designed with a redistributive goal, 
it's enough if the system as a whole comprising both taxes and benefits reaches the goals uh, that we that we want to set for for uh, for distribution and for example there was a study <clears throat> carried out during the program on on the value added tax in south africa and the findings of that study indicate that if there was a revenue neutral reform where the where the uh, uh, zero rated zero rating of the of in the value added tax system so i'm um, starting to tax the uh, currently zero rated activities with the, with the with the normal rate if those were abolished and and the and the revenues would be used to finance new social grants inequality would actually decrease so we would be able to uh, achieve a reduction in inequality without an increase in the net government spending, net in terms of also taking into account the tax receipt. So the effectiveness of direct transfers as, as opposed to tax um, can really be seen uh, in effectiveness in terms of reaching distributive goals can really be now seen during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and, and this is, um, in fact, uh, based, this is a research finding based on a study which just came out and which will be discussed uh, by my colleagues in, in what we turn next. So thanks, that was my uh, uh, set of opening remarks and now uh, over to Yuma Shudu and my colleagues. Thank you very much, Yuka, for the insight. So maybe if i could just kick it off with one question to you um you've spoken about benefits needing to be um, extended here in south africa but do you think that south africa has enough in its arsenal to continue to increase uh, the tax and benefit system um well that's ultimately an ethical political question because it it it, it relates to the um, uh, uh, to the size of the government that, that, that people want. Some would like to see a smaller government and others um, uh, um, uh, would argue that we need a fairly large government in order to meet all the, uh, all the necessary um, developmental goals. And economists alone cannot give uh, the direct answer to this. I would see that uh, rather than the overall, overall share of, of the government uh, from the GDP, I would I would really I mean focus on the quality of the interventions. I mean the quality on, on what we spend and, and quality in the in, in the in the also in the in the transfers. So that would be my my comment. So uh, rather than thinking about the overall the size of the pie. Thanks for that, Yuka. I'd like to bring in into this discussion uh, Christopher. Axelson, he's the Chief Director of Economic Tax Analysis at National Treasury of South Africa, Mimiki. She's Leolo, Senior Official at South African Revenue Service, and Dr. Gemma Wright, Research Director of South African of Southern African Social Policy Research Institute. So, Chris, let me perhaps start off with you talking about some of the tax policy measures that were put in place. Uh, by South Africa to mitigate the um, negative impact that uh, the COVID-19 had on households and businesses. Maybe you could just list a few of uh, the measures that South Africa put in place. Thanks, uh, Michelle, and thanks everyone. Um, I think, you know, just to start off, it's, it's great to see this level of research that's going into um, all of these policies, all the tax designs, um, the benefits that have been changing, um, this whole COVID period where all these changes have been made, I'm sure a lot of research will come out and already is starting to come out from the changes that have been made. And then hopefully we can get some data to make good informed decisions um, going forward. I mean, to give you sort of a perspective on what we've done, which I think will flow into a bit of the research that will be highlighted later. Um, you know, from our side on the tax side, you know, it, when the pandemic struck, when the national lockdown was announced, I mean, I think the main thing for us was trying to act as quickly as possible. Um, so it was within a week or two that we got those first initial tax measures announced. Um, we provided tax deferrals to firms. We tried to have an expanded employment tax incentive to keep people in their jobs. 
Um, we tried to do measures like fast tracking of that refund so that firms had enough cash flow. Um, we also had an additional deduction for donations to the solidarity fund so that if people wanted to contribute, they could do so um, and get a little bit back. In effect, it was government um, providing a partial funding of, of that solidarity fund. Um, it was quite difficult from the tax system to be able to provide assistance to lower income households. Um, the personal income tax is only paid by the top three or two deciles in the country. So it, you can't really give tax relief to those on the bottom if they're not paying tax from a personal income tax perspective. So I think a lot of the tax measures were really at trying to get firms to continue hiring employees, um, don't lay them off, um, and give them enough cash flow to continue operating. And then a lot of the, the poverty alleviation measures were done on the benefit side with the top ups and the additional new benefit grants that came into play. Um, I think it's been you know, the constraint on our side really was we very different to other developed economies where they had the space to borrow a lot more at incredibly low rates. Um, we, you know, it was difficult for us to borrow a lot more. Uh, our rates are very high. So there was this, this balance that you had to try and strike between how much support do we give the economy versus how much is it actually going to cost us and South Africans in, in the longer term um, with this additional debt. So a lot of those then turned into deferrals. So it was about the initial upfront um, cash flow, but then we do actually get the money back in the end. Some of them were for actual direct relief. So for example, the skills development levy, we gave a holiday. So that was an immediate cash into the hands. The employment tax incentive was supposed to be um, a cost a lot. And you know we really thought it would have been taken up, but actually the success of the temporary employment relief scheme from the UIF, which was very successful, then almost in effect undercut the employment tax incentive because you couldn't claim both. Um, so that's a broad overview of some of the tax uh, measures. Um, and I think part of this will get into the, the research that's going to come later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. I want to throw now to Mimiki. Mimiki, you were quite instrumental in putting together some of the research that we are discussing today. Maybe talk us through what are some of your major findings and how would that how that all related to South Africa? You will need to unmute, Mimiki. Sorry, you, you're still on mute. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mashidi. Uh, perhaps just to wrap off um, what uh, Chris has indicated um, around some of the tax relief measures that were implemented and how we see it as the tax administration and um, what uh, how we've costed it or at least how we've seen the um, measures um, manifesting themselves that in terms of what was initially estimated around 70 billion um, to be both uh, revenue permanent revenue losses as well as liquidity assistance um, of about 44 billion liquidity assistance and 26 billion of permanent revenue losses. What we've seen so far, and this is what was uh, presented in the budget document as well, is that we've seen quite a substantial amount of deferral arrangements that were made by our customs and excise um, clients, uh, roughly about 24 billion there. And uh, with regards to the permanent revenue losses that we've seen, as, as, as Chris has indicated, a huge portion of that coming through from the SDL, around 6 billion permanent revenue loss. Um, overall, we've seen that uh, so far, there's about 40 billion that we've given away in terms of tax relief measures. Uh, so it sort of gives you a context of, first of all, our revenue outcomes and where we ended off um, bringing in an additional 40 odd billion, I guess what was estimated for SARS versus um, what was um, the, the budget 2021 estimate. Uh, in that context, there's about 40 billion that we had to um, um, assist and facilitate in terms of COVID-19 related tax measures. Coming back to some of the projects that were initiated under Workstream 2, which Juka has mentioned, um, uh, uh, the Workstream 2 looks at um, public resource mobilization or domestic resource mobilization. It's mainly in the taxation space. Um, we have conducted a few uh, research studies. I think the most important one that we are highlighting today um, is with regards to some of the benefits um, that we've seen um, 
coming through from um, the additional relief measures, not only uh, over and above the, the, disaster, uh, the tax measures that were um, introduced under the Disaster Relief Act, there were additional measures that came through um, from the temporary employee, employee employer relief measures, as well as new measures that were put in place. And what we wanted to get a sense of is what have been the benefits for our, particularly those that are not within the tax net, what has been the benefit accrued to them and where, where would they have ended up had they not received these kinds of benefits. Um, there were other studies that were conducted under this particular work stream too. I think um, Juka has made and uh, has alluded to that with respect to where we see areas of opportunity, revenue opportunities. So there were two studies that were done in terms of the tax gap that we're seeing in the corporate income tax space in the non-financial sectors. Um, that, uh, that particular piece of research um, is available on our uh, SHI website. We've also looked at the impact of some of the um, in incentives that we've got in place, um, particularly with, with regards to depreciation allowances um, in place. So this is uh, some of the re recent studies that are published on our, uh, e uh, on our SA Tide um, website. But I think maybe just to move towards what it is today, why, why today we're meeting as a showcase, we are then showcasing today some of the work that has been done uh, it's uh, across many different departments, uh, uh, SARS being one of the participants in this particular study. Um, and I, I think I'll um, take it back to you, Mashuri. Thank you, Thank you so much for mentioning that, Mimiki. So just essay tied, maybe if I could go back and to tell those who are watching um, what it all what it all is, is a, it's a collaborative research policy making capacity building or partnership between the national treasury united nations university uh, united nations university world institute for economic development the south african revenue service like you mentioned at the department of planning monitoring and evaluation and the department of uh, trade and industry and uh, we couldn't do all of this without the support from the eu so these kind of collaborations are quite great when it comes to collecting research and ensuring uh, that uh, things continue to move and, and new studies are, are being found. So I just want to also just bring in Gemma at this stage. So based on the collaborative study that's been done in Gemma, um, how well did South Africa's tax and benefit system protect um, people financially during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you very much, Mr. Shredder. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Indeed, this was a great collaboration that involved people from UNE Wider, ourselves at Sasbury, um, the Saldry Research Unit at the University of Cape Town, and SARS, and, and the Department of Social Development. And we joined forces to um, explore the very first part of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa to look at um, the extent to which the tax and benefit arrangements supported people during that first hard level five lockdown. And what we found is um, that, in, broadly speaking, the system did indeed, as Christopher Axelson says, it kicked in incredibly quickly and made a huge difference in the lives of um, South Africans across the income distribution. Um, I've got just two slides um, to share with people, um, if I may, relating to um, the findings of our study. Um, but while I pull that up, just to say the exercise was undertaken using a tax benefit micro simulation model called SA mod, which um, is underpinned by the National Income Dynamics Study, NIDS Wave 5. And we created two modified versions of it. One that reflects the situation just before the pandemic, so in March 2020. And then the second data set was modified using the NIDS CRAM survey, which many and most of you will be familiar with, which was a rapid survey of a subset of the NIDS panel to look at the impact on people's earnings and standards of living 
um, during the um, year of 2020 thus far. And what we found was that if we apply the tax and benefit rules um, to the um, underpinning population within our micro simulation model, um, we we're able to explore the extent to which um, people were protected um, through the different arrangements that were in place. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Um, I am trying to share it now. Here we are. Is that sharing okay? Hopefully. Um, is that sharing, Mashudu? Yes, it is, Jen. Come on. Oh, thank you very much. So here's one of just two slides. It shows the poverty rates that we estimated using Statistics South Africa's three poverty lines, the food poverty line, the lower bounds poverty line, and the upper bounds poverty line, for the months of March, April, May, and June. March is underpinned by that data that I mentioned that reflects life before the pandemic. And April, May and June, we used the modification that took into account the transition of people who were in work, um, what their impact was for them during the first wave of the pandemic. And um, using a modeling technique, people in employment in the baseline period in March were rooted into four different scenarios. Either they had no impact or they lost their job or they retained their job but had reduced earnings or um, they were furloughed. And in the months of April, May and June, we introduced into our model the various additional um, um, policies that have been referred to. So in April, we simulate the TERS policy. In May, the benefit changes kicked in. So there were 250 rand hikes assigned to the old age grant disability grants, the care dependency grant, um, and the foster child grant. Um, May had a one-off um, payment additional payments made of 300 rand um, for um, recipients of the child support grant. But then in June, which is why we pushed the analysis as far as June, um, the situation stabilized in terms of the policies um, in that the um, caregiver social relief of distress benefit was introduced and the top up to the CSD was stopped. Um, so instead, there was the 500 rand payable to caregivers of children in receipt of the child support grant, which is, went to 7.1 million people. And then in the months of May and June also, of course, there was a 350 rand um, COVID SRD, um, social relief of distress benefit introduced. So if we look just at the food poverty line, the, the first row in this table, it shows that um, poverty did shoot up from about a fifth of people to over a quarter of people in, in April. And, um, but in the months of May and June, simulating the scenarios in this way, it came back down to broadly where it was prior to the pandemic. Crucially, the assumption that we apply is in with the analysis is that there's full take up. So if people are eligible for benefits, um, those benefits are assigned within the model to the individuals who are eligible for them. But the final column is really important because it shows what the situation would have been like during the first lockdown without these additional COVID-19 policies. So um, without um, TERS, the top ups of existing benefits and the introduction of the new benefits, food poverty would have shot up to about a third of the population. And 45% um, of people would have been below the lower bounds poverty line and almost 60% below the upper bounds poverty line. Um, 
So this enabled us to disentangle the um, different contributions made, the in, impact on the one hand of the um, pandemic and the associated lockdown on people's earnings and employment status, but on the other hand, and then in combination, the rem remedial packages that the government introduced. So my, the, the high level summary is that it made it a huge difference and the South African government acted extremely fast. Clearly, there's um, nevertheless still very high levels of poverty, but without the initiatives that were introduced, it would have been a, a great deal worse. And as such, the systems that were already in place reflect the fact that the social protection system is adaptive and can respond quickly to crises. Ashuda, would you like me to show the second slide or shall I pause for a moment? You can go ahead, you can go ahead Jim. Okay, on. so this second slide um, breaks it down in a bit more detail by household income deciles. So 10 equal groups of households based on their incomes in March 2020, just before the pandemic, and shows the um, percentage change in household disposable income uh, between March and June 2020. The final um, bar on the right hand side shows the overall situation for South Africa. Um, disposable income is people's incomes once they have paid their direct taxes and received the earnings and, and also any benefits that they're entitled to. So overall for the population as a whole, we found that um, mean household disposable income dropped by 11%. That's a little white dot in the final bar. Um, the um, grey um, bar shows the drop in earnings. We estimated uh, um, that disposable income would have dropped by 25% um, due to the fall in earnings across the country. However, it dropped to 11% rather than the full way down to 25% because of the things that kicked in. On the one hand, the auto, so-called automatic stabilizers, so they're the existing tax and benefit arrangements that existed before any new innovations were introduced and emergency measures. That's the pale blue coloring. And that, um, um, in some cases, for example, for people who lost their work would be re reflect um, the um, reduced payments of personal income tax. But the darker blue bar is particularly important and reflects the um, COVID related uh, initiatives. Um, so that includes, in fact, our, that TERS, um, but also importantly, all of the different benefits. And we see quite an interesting pattern across the um, 10 deciles moving backwards to the main part of the graph. Um, deciles 7 to 10 all experienced a, um, a decline in disposable income and six stayed roughly the same. But what we see is a very high percentage increase in disposable income in deciles one to five. Uh, the important thing to remember, of course, is that people in these deciles are extremely poor. So a high percentage change doesn't in fact mean very much in absolute rounds. Um, but nevertheless, it does show that um, the um, new arrangements that were introduced were um, targeted incredibly well towards the poorest households. And the reason why we see such an impact on the poorest SR is that the um, COVID SRD benefits represented a really big shift um, in terms of provision of support for people of working age. Prior to the pandemic, if you're aged 18 to 59 and hadn't been a contributor to the UIF scheme and weren't disabled, there was no social assistance apart from um, 
the ordinary social relief of distress in extreme situations so like fire and flood. However, both the COVID SRD and the caregiver SRD enabled people aged 18 to 59 to receive social assistance for the first time. And, and, and I think the caregiver SRD one is particularly exciting for me, given the work I've done over the years on the child support grant, because when that was first um, developed under the Lund Commission, um, the state maintenance grant had a component, it had many failings, but one positive thing was that it had a component for the caregiver, which was removed at the time of the introduction of the child support grant. So it played a very important role um, during that first period of the lockdown in terms of actual lands going into the pockets of extremely poor people. Thank you, I'll close down my slide now, but... Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma, for that. So we know that a number of these uh, initiatives are coming to an end, and they're starting to wind down. The 350 rand is also going to be um, ended pretty soon. So we want to just, what kind of impact then will that have on poverty alleviation? We've seen that it's had a very significant impact in addressing some of the uh, policy, uh, poverty issues, and it's helped a lot of households, but now, those that kind of relief is being taken away from the households. What has the study found in terms of what impact that will have on households going forward? I think that's really important, Mashudu. And this, in a sense, is a very positive story in terms of the way the government acted fast during this first wave that took place between April to June. But of course, the benefit hikes and the caregiver SRD were terminated in October and also the, the last one hanging on the, the, the 350 COVID SRD is due to be terminate this month. But even though they're terminating the um, crises of the pandemic, but also of high levels of poverty and inequality remain and winter is approaching. And so I think it behoves us all to uh, uh, really urgently explore ways in which the, the poorest 70% of the population can be supported during this incredibly difficult time. And what this research shows is um, the fact that government can do it. And I mean, with all of the existing benefits, it was in, in terms of implementation, a very straightforward thing to augment the, the size of the, the benefit. Um, my hope is that um, arrangements for the people of working age might be formalised more concretely so that government can respond to crises um, without the initial flurry that had to happen around the COVID SRD of getting people onto the system. And to our audience at home, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box. And once we've identified your question, we will put on your camera and your mic for you to ask our guests a question. Um, so Chris, if we come back to you, so maybe give us insight into the, the governments, um, what government had to really consider or weigh up when deciding on some of these measures to respond to the pandemic. We've been talking about how the 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 the, the uh, social grants now that SRD is now coming to an end in um, in, in in April um, and the kind of impact that will have on poverty and households are going forward. But it's a bit of a give and take. So. What has government had to give up in order to provide some of these relief measures? Thanks, Mishidi. I think it's, you know, government's in a quite a difficult position um, with the, such a crisis like this one with such a big drop in GDP. I mean, the, the scope for government to put money into the economy and get a very good return out of it is, is really high. It's, you know, and these are the situations where you do want government to act, you do want government to intervene, um, to keep the economy going, to, to really try and reduce the pressure on households. And I think they have um, done quite a lot of that to a good extent. And this is very good research to show that you know, some of those measures 
um, really have alleviated some of the, the pressure on especially lower income households. The, I think from a treasury perspective, which you see in the documents all the time is, what do we do about debt and debt stabilization? Um, and it's a, it's a very tricky call because you can look at these types of questions and say, well, you know, how can these not be extended or how can um, these grants be reduced? Um, and it's a very difficult, um, you know, thing that government has done by, by going this route. Um, but we do look at, you know, what's happening with debt, the destabilization. We've been quite fortunate in the last six months or so that the South African Revenue Service has done very well. We've got quite a bit of additional revenue um, than we thought, which can be, um, which really will help a lot of those metrics. Um, but there are a lot of other than funding pressures that come onto the budget um, that that government then worries about. And when you read the documentation that we sort of put forward in the budgets and, and the MTBPSs each year, I think it's it's trying to weigh up all these these different issues. Um, and you know, if you have a debt crisis, the impact on the poor will be, you know, probably a lot worse. Um, so you've you've really got to try and avoid that, I suppose, from our perspective, uh, as far as possible, and then do whatever you can within the envelope. Um, of what you have left to try and uh, make these make these adjustments to help households. I think it's it's been quite positive that I don't think we were overly pessimistic in the large um, forecasts of reductions in growth that we made last year. I think you know some of the measures did work, um, and you know using sort of off balance sheet measures, which is like the unemployment insurance fund. Um, as well as the reserves within the skills development levy and bringing those billions of rands into the economy without having this adverse impact on the overall budget. I think it really did help and it helped get the economy going a bit quicker than we thought. Um, and it's helped with that additional recovery. And hopefully if this recovery um, is robust and if, it's, if it isn't temporary, uh, there is a concern obviously that with the commodity prices are we're sort of in a commodity price boom and if those soften again then maybe um it will taper away but if it is a bit more of a robust recovery you know then you should see more revenues coming and you should see more space for um a bit more of these developmental objectives to be pushed um to really try and help but you know if you've got the evidence here and that's what this you know this research program is about is trying to get this evidence so that we can then you know, chat to all the different policymakers about this is a useful um, approach and you know this was what will have the biggest impact I think it really would try and sway some of those some of those views thanks Michelle. and Miki, Chris is talking about increase in um, revenue collections over the past couple of months well a whole lot better than what National Treasury has expected. Talk us through what SARS has had to do to ensure that at least we get a little bit more, more money in the kitty, given that we've had a couple of lockdowns which have had uh, an impact in revenue collections. Could this be because of improved compliance? What kind of compliance have we seen during this time? Thanks, Mashudu, yes. Um... The revenue outcomes that were announced on the 1st of um, April were definitely on the a surprise on the positive side, bringing in an additional 38 billion against what was um, the estimate uh, announced by the minister at, uh, at budget 2021 in February. Um, I think there's a couple of legs that we look at when we assess um, our revenue outcomes. And the first part, obviously, understanding the, the, the tax base, which is in the main the economy, and understanding that um, if, we, if we sort of track our quarter on quarter GDP performance um, since the, the, the pandemic, that we went through quite a steep uh, V downward um, contraction. And we've seen ourselves recover quite, some, quite a bit uh, in the last quarter or so as we've moved through the various stages of the lockdown regulations. So that's the first part uh, as to how the economy performed and how much we could extract from the activities of the economy. 
Second part of it is the tax policies uh, that I introduced. Um, you would recall that in budget 2020, um, the tax policies were almost neutral. So the two billion that was expected to be uh, lost from the um, adjustments that were made for PRT were offset by some of the gains that were expected from the excise, the fuel, um, as well as the introduction of the, um, the carbon tax. Um, having gone through the year that the, 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 the offset of the, the two billion um, in, in, uh, loss from the PRT uh, adjustments, as well as the increase from the indirect taxes, that that almost was shelved and um, did not have a material impact in the overall scheme of things because in the month of June, we then had the supplementary budget that was introduced um, to take into account the impact of the COVID-19 relief measures. And I think having taken cue from the supplementary budget in June, we've sort of had to also look at ourselves to say, first of all, um, understanding what um, scope the tax policies have and the new uh, disaster relief measures that are being introduced that will eat into our revenue collections. And second of all, understanding where the economy is going and, and that uh, not only South Africa, but globally, that we're experiencing uh, severe contractions in, in e economic activity. We had to look um, inward within ourselves and um, strengthen the commitments that we had put in the annual performance plan. We had indicated in our annual performance plan that we would like to at least co collect about 7.5% of our total tax revenue from SARS's direct efforts. We call that compliance revenue. And we have put in place um, activities and measures to make sure that we do indeed bring in the revenue that we can, as SARS, demonstrate the value that we add as a tax administration. And you would recall some of you who may have been um, following the commissioner's um, presentations um, during the, the, the last, the first week of April, where he sort of touched on some of the things that we, we were we embarking on. And maybe I'll just touch on a few, um, just so that we give a context to this. In terms of um, tax avoidance practices, we had looked at uh, uh, refund leakage protection. So making use of extended data, machine learning, artificial, artificial intelligence, we went through um, quite a lot to try and detect um, taxpayers who may be testing the system to fraudulently claim for refunds that are not due to them. And in this case, there was um, um, about 57 billion that was um, claimed back or clawed or protected because of some of these uh, activities that were done in the re refund leakage protection space. space. Um, with regards to customs non-compliance, um, there was a lot of work that was done to crack down on the illicit trade. Um, and also not only in illicit trade, but also counterfeit goods, um, illicit cigarettes, alcohol, rhino horn, and pro prohibited COVID-19 medicines that uh, would have come into the country. There was quite a lot of work that was done with regards to dealing with some of the emerging uh, risks that we picked up, again, using a lot of data analysis to look at uh, some of the personal protective equipment tenders that were awarded that did not have, um, were not associated with tax compliance, and therefore there was quite a work, bit of work that was done in that space. Um, uh, I think maybe I'll pause here, uh, but just to it, just to give us a sense of the kind of work that we we were embarked on um, to make sure that we can in fact um, bring in the revenue that we had promised in our APP with regards to SARS's own efforts. But what we also saw, more importantly, is the increase and the rise in voluntary compliance, where we've seen, um, in terms of our various compliance measures, that. In, uh, both individuals, um, companies, pays you and employers, vet vendors, also coming through making sure that they file on time because obviously they would want to access some of the disaster relief measures that were being offered, uh, payments coming through on time, and a, just a general sense of a lot more positive response as we're going through to make sure that people do um, are able to access our facilities a lot more easier given that we are under um, strict lockdown conditions. And those who were keen to voluntarily comply really did um, show up and did um, make use of the facilities that we had um, enabled technologically for them to be able to access our, our, our services as the South African Revenue Service. We've got a question from Ibrahim Khalil Hassim. Is it possible to model for this project what the impact of ending the SRD will be on poverty? 
Um, th thank you. Really important question. Um, and yes, in, in theory, it is eminently possible to model that. Ideally, we would want a more up-to-date underpinning data set. Um, and for another study, we have done that where NIDS has the, been adjusted to reflect the position of the quarterly labour force survey Q4 2020, which is most up-to-date information we could find. And, and then to repeat an exercise such as I've presented, but looking more at the present day rather than um, last year's March to June time window and, and to do a with and without the COVID SRD benefit. So yes, it is doable, but we, we haven't done it in this study, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, maybe let's talk through some of the recommendations from the study that you've recently uh, completed for the South African government. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the um, the 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 one of the important. Um, the, the really exciting policy shift that we have seen in providing support for adults of working age um, really shines a light on how effective that targeting that group is as an age group um, in reducing poverty amongst um, the, the most deprived income deserves. So um, I, I sincerely hope as South Africa having taken this important step to provide material support for people in this age band, um, we'll, we'll be able to find a way of institutionalizing that more formally um, so that indeed the other benefits will be more effective for the groups that they're intended. So child support grant wouldn't be so diluted across other members of the household and the old age grants. Similarly, we, we found for older people, for example, that food poverty was um, eliminated in households containing older people if we assume full take up of all the benefits under the, the maximum provision that um, was, was offered under the June situation. So um, that would be very much um, an exciting thing to see to come out of that. And just secondly, um, the um, COVID SRD benefit was um, in, um, a small amount of money, but it did make a big difference in people's lives. But its eligibility criteria were extremely stringent. You had to be unemployed and have zero um, income, and which was um, checked in people's bank accounts that they literally had zero coming in. Whereas it'd be good to bring that more into line, um, at the least with other types of benefits within the South African system, for which there's a means test that is above zero. But again, they, of course, that would cost more, but it would bring it more into line with other benefits. Our speakers are here for you to ask questions. So if you do want to ask a question, please pop your question in the chat box. We do still have some time to take some of your questions um, at this point. So please feel free to um, populate your question in the chat box or alternatively you can try and raise your hand, uh, put down your name and we'll unmute you so you can um, uh, ask the speakers a question. Um, Yuka, I just wanted to ask you about these kinds of collaborations and the importance of the collaborations when it comes to, we've got the National Treasury collaborating with um, UniWIDA, IFRIP and other departments within the economic cluster. We know that the work of SA Tide has been generously supported by the United Nations. So we are very much grateful for the support, but maybe talk us through the importance of such collaborations when it comes to research. Uh, thank you, Mashudo. Yes, so, uh, so this is research that tries to be as relevant as possible for the, uh, for the policy making in, in, in a country. So for researchers, it's a, is a unique opportunity to interact with policymakers and then really try to I mean, 
try to work on, on things that can make a difference. And um, I do hope that the also, the, I realize that policymakers and people in, who, who are South African uh, government officials are extremely busy with the day-to-day -day work, but I, I do hope that they can also I mean, benefit in terms of um, being part of the, of the research groups. So um, in my understanding, this is, and in my experience, this is one of the, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, this is one research project that really, I mean, has brought together in a completely new way, uh, researchers and policymakers working on the same papers on, 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 on together, co-authoring, and then hopefully providing credible and useful evidence. Thank you very much for that. We've got a question from Anthony. He's asking, may you clarify, or is, this question is to Yuka. May you clarify on the point from Yuka's presentation that says, despite the significant tax capacity, scope for improvement exists. Does this point suggest that South Africa's tax system has capacity to accommodate further invest in interventions to assist the poor? Yeah, thanks for that. So that wouldn't really be a, a, a tax intervention. It would rather be an intervention via the benefit side. And where, where then tax comes into the picture is, I mean, by financing some of these activities. But of, obviously now, I mean, I mean, I do share the, um, the, the, the view that, that Chris pointed out that we, I mean, now, hopefully soon, uh, we are moving towards the post-pandemic world. And then we need to also start to worry about the, I mean, financing the deficit and, 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 and reducing it in order to be prepared for the next crisis. So um, we need to uh, start thinking of, um, of what are the really the crucial benefits, what are, the, what are, the, what are really uh, crucial tax expenditures and, 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 and from where we could perhaps make, make some cuts in order to, uh, to, uh, to uh, improve the fiscal situation. But that's a, that's a situation which is, which is the same across the whole world. So in, a, in that sense, we are in the same boat in, in almost all countries. Uh, I've got a question for Mimiki. It's from Peter Tartman Talto. He's asking that you lay out more detail on the SARS own efforts revenues and how much this has smoothed tax collection last year and how it might improve in the next or in the three years ahead. Um, thanks for that question, Peter. Um, so um, the details around SAS's own efforts, um, like I indicated earlier on, maybe let me take a step back just in terms of SAS's, um, um, the SAS's mandate and where, where we fit in into the overall fiscal picture. You would be aware that we are responsible for collecting almost 90% of consolidated national revenue. So for us, the achievement that we saw in the financial year end that has just passed now, uh, the additional almost 40 billion that we collected does make quite a bit of an uh, improvement in terms of our overall consolidated national revenue space. Um, and again, in line with um, the vision 2024 that the commissioner has indicated, um, the, the, the five years that he's been given to turn around SARS, one of the things that um, he wants to do is to make sure that we encourage voluntary compliance as much as possible. And to that extent, there are about nine strategic objectives that have been crafted by SARS with the intent of um, pushing a lot more South Africans towards this culture of voluntary compliance. Now, one of the objectives there, it talks about expanding and increasing the use of data to improve the integrity um, and develop insights and improve key performance outcomes. Why I'm mentioning this is not only do we live up to this uh, particular objective five in terms of the day-to-day the -day work that we do, making sure that when we do follow up on some of the areas of non-compliance that we need to um, strongly target on, that it is based on data and evidence. Um, and therefore, to that extent, there are a lot of things that we've identified in our uh, annual performance plan that we've sort of said we will target and focus towards to make sure that 
we leave no room for areas of non-compliance and that we are hard on those who are non-compliant and we've got um, activities that are lined up to make sure that we, we deal with areas of, of, of non-compliance that we've identified. To that extent, in the 2020-21 um, financial year that has just passed, I've indicated some of the areas where we've particularly targeted and we've um, worked through to make sure that not only do we bring in additional revenue, but we also mitigate against possible uh, fraud against the fiscals. With regards to where we are heading in the next three years, uh, I think in our um, annual performance plan, again, in our strategic plan, we do talk of a couple of areas that we want to focus on. The first one being the work that is being conducted by the Davis Tax Committee. You are aware that um, in the past two years, we have requested um, the Davis Tax Committee to sort of re reinitiate some of the, the work that they started. And, and, and this time around, one of the things that we sort of worked towards is to having specific recommendations that uh, SARS as a um, tax administration institution can start acting on as and when the, Dix, the Davis Tax Committee identifies areas of either policy, um, policy improvements that can be worked on and or tax administration improvements that can be worked on. So there is a lot of work that um, has st started with the Judge da Dennis Davis. Um, the report that they conducted on the tax gap uh, has been tabled. So there's a lot of revenue recovery prog program work that has started and will continue be informed by the, the, the report that the Davis Tax Committee is working on. Um, as you are aware that certain parts of um, the SARS uh, were decommissioned in the past few years, and those that were de decommissioned have now been reinitiated and or amplified. Obviously, there's a lot of work in the large business, um, uh, large, bus large business and international businesses that uh, we're working on. We have uh, re um, initiated the LBC uh, a few years ago. We, we in the, um, announced already that we are um, re-establishing the business unit as a centralized unit to make sure that it deals with all tax matters, all tax matters of our large businesses end to end from the beginning right up to till the end. One of the other areas that we're working on and improving on and um, it's around the criminal and illicit econo economic activities. Um, we are aware that there is a um, unit that has now been set up to particularly follow up on this particular part of our economy to make sure that those who are outside of the net are brought into the net and those who have been defrauding um, the, the, the tax system are brought to book. As I think also, as you are aware, um, we have lost quite a lot of resources in the past few years. And you would have seen in recent times ad advertisements being announced by, this, by SARS um, indicating that we are now um, recruiting and hiring resources to make sure that uh, we bring in all the revenue that we can with all the capability that we require. And therefore, in the next three years, part of the ex additional funding that we've received um, from National Treasury, it's working towards bolstering our own capabilities to make sure that we can bring in the maximum revenue or optimize revenue collections as the SARS Act um, demands of us. I think I'll stop here, Mashuki, thanks. Thank you very much, um, Mimiki. We have come to the end of our program this afternoon. So what I wanted is for a nice wrap. So I'll give um, the speakers or the panelists just a minute to uh, give a few closing remarks. We can start off with um, you, Mamikina, that you're still on the floor. Just the closing remarks, just a minute, if or, or, or even less. Thank you. Thanks, Mashudu. I think um, um, it's the, the work that we've been involved in with on the SA Tide program truly speaks to not only SARS's um, ethos and, and, and principles around making sure that the data that we work with or the, the information that um, advises the policy that we take, the actions that we take, tax administration actions that we take are informed by evidence and are informed by data. And I think, like I mentioned, one of the objectives that we talk about in objective five is around appreciating the use of data in order to deliver results. And for us, it's uh, supporting an initiative such as this, the SA Thai program, and particularly providing the necessary 
data, anonymized secure data to allow, allow researchers and to allow analysts to actually look at our own tax administration data and lead us to areas where we can improve. And not only SARS as a tax administration, but also for treasury and other government departments around how to better design um, policies and how to better implement some of the areas for, 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 for broader improvement. But I think we're also um, sort of following international best practice where tax administration data is being used um, almost as a supplement to other data sources such as surveys, national accounts, and other statistical data. So for us, it truly really has been um, quite a uh, useful exercise and, and quite an honor for us to be involved with this, this particular um, program, but because it has also allowed us as SARS to make sure that we bring in some of our young professionals to be involved with some of the research programs and therefore ex getting, gain, gaining access not only to local peers but also to international academia and international practitioners who would help us shape some of the research agenda some of the um, some of the work that we we need to think about and implement as the tax authority and i think um uh, just as a last point is just to indicate some of the successes that we've seen in the SA type program is that um, we have um, seen that the program awarding around 14 PhD scholarships across the various clusters that are involved. Six that were awarded at National Treasury, five that were awarded at SARS and three for the DTI. And I'm quite pleased to report that from SARS's perspective of those five bursaries that were awarded for the PhD scholars, we already have one um, who, who has graduated in the first quarter of this 2021. So we're truly um, appreciative of, of the platform that has been given not only to our staff members, but also to our colleagues in government to be able to step up our own capability and be able to deliver some of the work in a way that um, is much more optimized and a much more enriched and a lot more informed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mimiki. Gemma, you're up next. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly from me, I'd like to say that this program um, that's um, with the support of the European Union and, and, and the, um, all of the different stakeholders involved it's been an honour and a privilege to be part of it and involved in projects such as the one I spoke a little bit about earlier, um, especially in terms of the way in which um, researchers and civil servants are invited to work together and pull their knowledge and expertise and experiences as, as colleagues in the, in the collective exercise. It's a, um, a very special opportunity to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma. Yuka? Uh, thanks. So I, I would just like to second what my colleague said that the, uh, I really think, think that the, um, the data access um, has been really the crown jewel of the, uh, or one of the crown jewels of the pro program. And I think, I mean, it's also served as a, as a role model for some of the neighboring countries. And so they want to achieve something similar that the South Africa already has up and running, that has spillovers within the continent. Uh, so um, as a researcher, I would hope that maybe we can continue and, and continue further developing it. And, and there's a possibility to have even more granular data. And, 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 and I think we can make, make progress with, with, with this data and, and, and even better data. Uh, what I would like to see a little bit more would be perhaps um, um, some experimentation with respect to um, to, uh, to different arrangements. So those we haven't yet seen, but that would, there could be a possibility to learn even more. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, we've got uh, Chris. Right, thanks, Michelle. I mean, I'd just like to say thanks to you know, all the researchers, everyone involved. I, you know, tax policy doesn't usually get um, that much attention, especially some of the more arcane or you know, some of the more unknown 
um, elements in the tax legislation. And now with this data available, you can look at things like depreciation allowances for anonymized firm, and you can look at some of these other aspects that really not much light has been shone on them before. So it really helps us, you know, we don't have unlimited resources in government to then research all these issues and actually find out what's going on there. So suddenly to have, you know, it's almost free resources coming in to look at all this data and provide some insight into it really does help us. I think it also helps just because they're independent. I mean, they might be um, co-authored with the government official, but they're independent papers. Um, so this isn't government trying to put forward a particular stance, a particular view on, on some of these points. Um, they can say what they need to say, um, which is very useful. And then it can help guide the discussion. So I think it's been, it's really useful. I hope we can uh, do more, get more interesting insights um, and try and push some of these um, these new uh, agendas and new potential policy frameworks uh, forward. So thank you very much. A very big thank you to all our panelists this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and all the insights that you have given during this hour. But uh, I'd also like to give a big thank you to all our official partners uh, without whom this would not have been possible. So we started off with the United Nations University World Institute for Economic Development, UniWider, the National Treasury, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, uh, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and most of all, the European Union for their continued commitment and invaluable financial support for this very important program. And a big thank you to you, our audience, for joining us and taking the time out this afternoon to listen to our discussion. But uh, do uh, look out for the next date of, for our second dialogue under the series. Thanks you once again to everyone who participated and joined us from home. Um, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Have a lovely afternoon.